Bienvenue à la classe de maître du clarinettiste Kimball Sykes, classe de maître donnée dans la saison de l'OF 2021. Kimball Sykes est clarinettiste solo de l'Orchestre du Centre national des arts depuis 1985. Il s'est produit sur place et en tournée avec l'Orchestre symphonique de Vancouver, a été membre de l'Orchestre de l'Opéra de Vancouver et l'un des membres fondateurs du Vancouver Wind Trio. Il a été aussi clarinettiste solo de l'Orchestre symphonique d'Honolulu de 1983 à 1985. Monsieur Sykes s'est produit comme soliste avec l'Orchestre du CNA à de nombreuses reprises. Il a aussi joué en soliste pour 13 Strings, l'Orchestre symphonique de Honolulu et l'Orchestre philharmonique d'Auckland en Nouvelle-Zélande. De plus, M. Sykes a joué en soliste dans des ensembles de musique de chambre dans le cadre de diverses émissions de la chaîne anglaise de la Société Radio-Canada. Kimball Sykes enseigne présentement à l'Université d'Ottawa. Welcome to the Masterclass of Canadian Clarinetist Kimball Sykes, Masterclass given through the Orchestre de la Francophonie 2021 season. Kimball Sykes joined the National Arts Centre Orchestra as principal clarinet in 1985. He has performed and toured with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra and was a member of the Vancouver Op Op Opera Orchestra. While in Vancouver, he was a founding member of the Vancouver Wind Trio. From 1983 to 1985, he was principal clarinet of the Honolulu Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Sykes has performed as a soloist with the NAC Orchestra on numerous occasions. Other group he has appeared with as soloists include 13 Strings, the Honolulu Symphony, and the Auckland Philharmonia in New Zealand. As well, Mr. Sykes has performed numerous solo and chamber music programs for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Kimball Sykes is currently on faculty at the University of Ottawa. L'OF reconnaît l'appui du gouvernement du Canada et Emploi Québec, Île de Montréal. L'OF remercie ses commanditaires, Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie la fondation suivante, la Fondation RBC, Fondation Sibila S, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et la Zeller Family Foundation. The OF acknowledge the Government of Canada's support in Emploi Québec, Île de Montréal. The OF would like to thank their private sponsors, Canimex and Panorama Media. The OF would like also to thank the following foundations, Fondation Sibila S, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada, and the Zeller Family Foundation. Pour suivre nos activités, nous vous invitons à consulter le site web de l'OF, la page Facebook où vous y retrouverez le calendrier de nos événements, ainsi que le canal YouTube et le hashtag OF-2021. To follow us, please consult our website at orchestrefranco.com, our Facebook page where you will find our event calendar planned during this 2021 season, our YouTube channel and the hashtag OF-2021 on Instagram. Please welcome Kimball Sykes and it's all yours. Hello, Valentina. Can you unmute? Hello. So Hi. remind, where were you, where are you right now? Okay, right now I'm in Marseille at my grandma's place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but yes, normally I live in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, uh -huh. where I did master there with Julian Hervé and Bruno Bonancia. And um, yes, but I'm Italian actually. Yeah. <laughs> So remind, uh, just give me a rundown of which excerpts you would like to play today. Okay, I will start with Sherazade, uh, second act, uh, Semiram Semiramis, uh, Traviata, and mm -hmm. Beethoven number eight. Okay, let's just start.
what what is the marking at the beginning of this solo? What what what's what what is the indication? What does he write? Poet, yeah. Ad libitum. Right. And so it, it's quite declarative, right? It, it's like um, recitative, like. Yes. Does he write that in that in your edition? Sometimes you see that in some oh, editions. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So I think it could be a little bit more. You, you play very nice. You have a very beautiful sound. Um, but I think it could be a little bit more uh, declarative, like, you know, because what are the strings doing underneath you? What's happening in the orchestra? Like, well, they arrive, they arrive on the forte, on the mm -hmm. corona, but then they stop. But underneath you, they're, the whole time, they're going, yup, up, 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 right? Yes. So I think that you have to have some relation to that tempo with those quarter note triplets at the beginning. So if it's like, mm -hmm. da, 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 ba, 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 you know, so. And also, I think you could think about, it happens three times, right? Yes. That um, you could vary things a little bit. Like, you know, in terms of that, the, the, the B flat, the, the C bemol, you could maybe play it, the second one maybe longer, the third one longer, or maybe do, do more diminuendo in one, or so that, that the B flat isn't, it's not always the same each time. Okay. Okay. Um, and in the last one, I think you did you lose count a little bit about where you were? Yes. Yeah. Normally... So what I, I have, I mean, uh, this is not my idea, but I was given like a, a system where by somebody to help count. So like say in the last one, you know, it's it's like that pattern twice and then the pattern changes, right? So, so you can write like over the first two of the pattern, like one, two, and then one, two, three for the, and you go by the top C's just to keep count of where you are. Yes. Cause it's easy to, it's easy to play too many or think, where am I? And then something happens, you know, and you can do that for each of them. Like, I think like two slow ones. So the second one. So two, two sort of on the slower side and three sort of faster. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is coming out of each of these cadenzas, the orchestra has to redo the ba 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 So coming out of each of these, you have to be very clear. So the conductor is waiting for you, you know, so. It has to be very clear. And, you know, one thing you could do is, do you record yourself? Yes, like, sometimes. You, so record yourself playing this and then think, imagine that you're the conductor. So as you were listening to it, actually even just be a conductor, think how clear is the way you're coming out of each of these little um, cadenzas how clear is it for the conductor? Okay. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to give that a try again? Yeah. So a little bit more declarative, long, like bomb, each one. And maybe in the last one, you know, on the long B flat, actually you've cut out a little bit in the video. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think we may have lost her. I think we have lost her. Um, we'll just wait a second to see if she can reconnect. If not, I suggest going to then uh, to someone uh, to Alexander okay. and coming back. She has disconnected. 
So, oh, Kimball, you're about to lose your camera. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Alexander, do you mind uh, unmuting and turning on your camera? Okay. Hi, Alexander. Hi. So, what are you going to play um, for me? I have. First, I'm going to Capriccio Espanol. Yep. Then Firebird by Stravinsky. Right. Then um, La Forza del Destino, the Overture. Right. And then um, first and second movement of Brahms Three. Okay, so we not we, we may not get to all of that. Right. But let's uh, let's start with the Capriccio. Okay. something I'm gonna I, I want you to be the teacher I'm gonna sort of play and I want you to make a comment on physically what I'm do what I'm doing okay Yeah, I think you could just be. Uh, I'm. I'm not saying don't move when you play, but if I see somebody moving in a way that I think is detrimental to what you're trying to do musically, I think it's something you 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 should probably not do. <laughs> okay. No. So I just think in this, just get the air moving and move the fingers. You know, keep it simple. <laughs> you know, uh, as we all know, um, tension is the enemy for, certainly for if, if, if you want to play fast. You want to think loose and supple in the body. Okay, so just just do, try that again, the first one, and just, just sit and play. <laughs> you don't have to muscle the, the notes out. Have you ever, um, have, you, have you heard of Alexander Technique? I have, but I haven't learned much about it. Okay. I mean, very simple, mo their, their basic mantra is um, uh, let the neck be free to let the head go forward and up to lengthen and widen the spine. So the basic idea behind it is you, you try and release whatever tension is in the neck and you try and elong elongate the space between the, the muscles and the bones. Because you know what happens if, if 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 I was to come up and behind you and scare you and go like boo, what, what would your reaction be? What, what do you do with your body? Yeah. So when we play, there's always this tendency to come into the instrument. So it's like we almost have to give ourselves instructions to do the opposite. Because you know, and when I when I said I was going to scare you, because when we get on stage and we get tense, the body's reaction to being um, that flight or fright, flight or flight response is to you know tense the muscles up, ready for to you know to fight or to run. But we don't need that to play. So it's 
you almost need to give yourself instructions to do the opposite. Think up and out. Okay. Um, musically, the, the challenge in this excerpt is to get the trills in, but then after the trills, the, the 16th notes have to be absolutely in time. So I would practice this um, without trying it without the trills. Just play. Just try that. Yeah, again, a little slower. Yeah, so it's not totally even, even without the trills. You can just play slow. Yeah, so you need to work even slower with a metronome, just being able to do this without the trills, and then put in one trill. And then there's the question of where do you do two trills, where do you do one trill, or do you do tr two trills throughout? Um, I've done it doing two trills throughout, but I've also done it doing, you know, starting on a... From there doing like a... It's like a very snappy mordant. You know, you, you want to get that, that energy. And like, look what he writes in the opening also, like... Uh, Conforza, you know, very just sort of like strong and bravura playing. You know, really, you know, sort of like Spanish matador type um, uh, sort of bravura. Okay. Um, so what I just mentioned about the trills is the same thing for the second solo mm -hmm. that starts at C. Now, one of the challenges in this, this one is there's a very strange articulation, you know, that trill, that sort of <laughs> slurring into the <laughs> It's a little bit like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. It's, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I would say for the for this really practice slowly, like re until you can abs play absolutely evenly. Um, th this this passage, and at the very end, you know when you have that's there you're accompanying the solo violin, but then all of a sudden you're solo again. So. Okay? Yeah. Good. So let's... Um, were you planning to do the B-flat solos also, or just the A-clarinet solo? I don't mind. In the interest of time, you said you had Firebird also? Yeah. Do you want to do that? Sure. Sorry, and remind me again, it was the, the Firebird and what else? Um, oh, the Brahms? Yeah, yeah, the Brahms and then the Verdi as well. All right, let's let's do the firebird.
Okay, good. It, rhythm was not bad. Like a number of years, like in our orchestra, when we had second clarinet auditions about 10 years ago, we had, this was on the list. And I would say that 90% of the players didn't, didn't play this in rhythm. So the real challenge in this is, is aside from the notes, is <laughs> really strong sense of rhythm. And it's interesting, the very opening of this, um, in some, we just did this a few weeks ago, and in the conductor, the score that the conductor had, which was the latest version, it, there, little, there was a little accent on the beginning of each of those. So he wanted to very clearly to hear. Like each eighth note had an accent? Each eighth note had an accent. It's, it's, it's funny because, you know, he, there's the original ballet version, which this part is on the E-flat clarinet. And then he wrote the suite in 1919. Then he wrote a suite of the 1911, and then he wrote another suite in uh, 1945, and he turned it. Then he, he turned it into a trill. It just says trill. So, but conductors tend to want to hear. They gotta 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 get really clearly. You know. So if and and to get that really clean, sometimes I play. I add an extra note at the end just so I'm on time. For practice purposes mm -hmm. okay so throughout this you need to be thinking uh, 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 almost the big pulse yes uh, uh, but also uh, 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 uh. you know you need to be your own um, what do they call it um, beatbox <laughs> you need to have like all these uh, time divisions going on at the same time like done done yep bop, bop, yep bop, bop, yep bop, bop, yep do you want to try it again? So really think of very rhythmic. Yeah. Can you try, I see, it's not bad, but I still see like you come down when you start to play. Remember when I talked about like, think up and out. So just almost be thinking you're floating. And rather than coming down to start. Yeah, it's a late. So, so happens in this excerpt is oftentimes because it's so uh, technically challenging is we forget about the sound so the sound starts to go what I call sort of like we it's like you know in this like the last minute of the Stravinsky three pieces it's wrong clarinet but lots oftentimes what I hear is people let their sounds go same thing here really think just play slow your best sound. Yeah, so you're doing a false fingering for the C sharp? Yeah, but with, with the thumb. Uh, that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> I would either do it without or regular fingerings. Well, I mean, I was, I was originally doing without, but it was what my, what Simon just recommended to do. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of, I've, I've done it both ways, but I'm, I've am strongly sort of started to lean towards just doing regular fingerings. Mm -hmm. I think it's more it's more secure. Regular yeah. fingerings meaning like the actual Reg, C regular C sharp. Yeah. So I would I practice it both ways, but I. I if you can get really secure doing regular fingerings, I, I think it's preferable. Okay. You would do sort of fork F sharp to D? Fork, uh, which one are we talking about? 
The second one? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know, I'd leave off the key for the um the D. Just it's so fast. Yeah. And obviously the last one is regular fingerings. Okay. Just in the opening what you just played. Two, three, one, two, three. I be, that's that's what I'm thinking inside. Because uh, 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 the tendency in the bar in the third bar is to come too early. Rather than you know, same thing after uh, before twelve. extremely secure in the rhythm and again if this is one where you can just put the metronome on eights and just start slow yeah okay um, and also for the beginning do you ever practice you know the do you ever practice body make them I have yeah you know you know the the first one you know for this passage here To practice the first time through at 60. Then double time. To get that feeling of being the, the fingers um, being able to move very, the hand has to be very supple, no tension at all. You know, and that includes the thumb. We forget about the thumb sometimes, but in terms of how we grip, but sometimes we really push that thumb into the clarinet. And you don't want that, you just want... So, I would practice some, for these trills, not, not trills, but measured trills, I would call them, you know, you know, vadi mekum. You know, for the, for the, each of these little passages here, okay? Yeah. Uh, do you want to, how much time do we have left? Anyways, let's. Do you want to go on to the let's see something different? How about the um, the Verdi? Sure. Edition, do you have it's the one you sent me at the very beginning do you you have the first uh, eighth pickup separated or slurred oh it is separated yeah but I think it I don't think that's actually correct because I, I have the recordy version and it's it's like it is the second time it should be slurred da -da. okay It's slur this time, this next time. And also, I don't know if I can just, I don't know if you can see this. Like, there should be the diminuendo like here, this, that it, like it repairs the second time. There, there's some issues with this, this audition. Also at the end, when you have, I'm used to that being slurred. And also, uh, and slurred. Yeah, it makes more sense. You kind of you sort of played it that way, <laughs> but there, there's some problems I think with this this edition. Especially because I I just I found this part in the opera where they actually sing it, and mm -hmm. just imagining someone going da 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 da, da like <laughs> singing it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So as you say, this what's what's happening in the accompaniment here? What's happening in the accompaniment? What's the orchestra doing while you're playing this?
It's the harp. Uh, right. Harps play. So the tempo is quite strict, but over top of it, you just have to sing over top of this. And you know, in the like in the opening, he writes espressivo cantabile. Then he writes this. I I, I wouldn't think it's so literally like so literally like it's you know it's like. I think he's just trying to write expression. <laughs> He just wants you to be expressive. It's interesting because, do you know the slow solo in Shostakovich's Ninth Symphony? It's a big... Yeah. There's a lot of th these markings all over the place, and I did this. I did that piece one time with Shostakovich's son conducting. Wow. And then so he came up and just said, you know, my dad was just trying to show expression. You don't have to take it so literally. He was just trying to like put in an indication of, um, to, to be expressive. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little bit the same with these markings. And, you know, like in, after G, one, two, three, four, five, you know, six, it looks like a diminuendo over the whole bar. You know, after, <laughs> you see that there's looks like a diminuendo over the whole bar. I think that's more just a, a mark of expression for the bar. You know how in Schubert, like a Schubert Eighth Symphony, there's these marks that look like um, diminuendos, and they're basically a mark of expression for the bar. I think it's a little bit like that here. There are some places where you know you could point out the note a little bit more, like after, right at the beginning. Pa, you know, he's got this circumflex sort of accent. I don't think it's like pa da, but pa da ya da. So can you try it in that light? Can you try this ice script again? Okay, so that pickup was not in. The eighth note did not match the tempo of the quarter notes after. Pa di da da. Remember the harp's doing triplets. Pa di da di da. Slur. Da, ya, da. Yeah, I know it's missing in your part, I think. So in the end, I think you can be, you can get quite expressive, more expressive, you know. sound through that. Just play that bar. That's better. Again, you're you're sort of moving in a way that I hear the bump when you do the beat. That's better. For the beginning. Sorry, I was. I know we're not in real time. I keep forgetting we're not in real time. So it, I was going to say more. Da 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 tea. Can you just go from the second one? Okay. Okay. 
so I'm hearing a little bit of almost like a Doppler effect, you know, with with your moving. I guess it's because it's going back and forth past the microphone, but. Again, try just be a little bit more still. Good. So you played more at the end, but your sound suffered a little bit. It started to get a little spread. Really think of that concept, the concentrated. Do you think of a syllable when you play? Like for the shape of the mouth? Uh, I've been told like, like an U could work. U, yeah. And as we get higher, like towards the upper clarion into the altissimo, what does it change to? E, e. So as you're going higher, it goes as you get higher. So the back. So what happens when you say E? What happens to the back of the throat? Well, your, your tongue goes up like in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt like your tongue was in too low a position um, to, for this as the, as the um, tessitura started going up. Mm. Can you take it from? Kimball? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm the timekeeper, yep. and I have to let you know that uh, we should move really soon to uh, our next participant okay. or Valentina came back as well. So if you want to go back to her and okay. give her comments, I'll just it's do 30, up to you. I'll just do 30 seconds with. Okay. Sorry to interrupting. No, but... that's fine. No, I, I, I asked you to. That's good. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you. Alexander, can you take it from. And really think, mm, and as you get higher, e. Keep the sound very focused. Good. Just the last thing. D don't as you get more intense. Don't rush. Mm. It's still it's okay. Good. Nice to hear you play. Where, where are you right now? Uh, Montreal. Montreal. Okay. So should we try Valentina again? Sorry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would suggest maybe not going over 10 minutes because we're already running late for okay. our participants. All right. Thank you. Okay. Should I play it again? Yes. So, like I said before, I th still think that your quarter note um, triplets should have a little bit more relation to what's happening in the strings. When the strings are going ba 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 rather than ba, but that's my own personal feeling on this, and that's how I'm used to playing it or hearing it. Uh, it's a little bit too, and, and again, it can be a little bit more um, dramatic. You're very nice. You're, it's very like. I think it'd be a little bit more. Pom, pom, pom. And again, coming out of it. Okay. Can you just 
try that. Yes. Yeah, for me, I would hold the last A a little bit longer. La da 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 dee da dum, pa da da dum, dee da dum, pa da da dum. For it to be clear for the conductor, because otherwise, if it's not clear, the conductor sort of has to come in, stab at the strings, and it, and then it goes blah 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 blah. You know, dee da dum, pa da 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 pa 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 pa, dee da da dee da da pa 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 pa. Okay, good. Um, I'm having a little, with the connection, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing. Really? Yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm hearing it like, it, in terms of the internet connection, it fades, comes in and out still a little bit. So, but that's, we can't do anything about that right now. So what was your other excerpt? Right? Yeah, it's very good. The only thing I would um, just suggest is be careful you don't, you know that when you have, um, that it doesn't sound like, it should just be. So the re don't, don't make the resolution too strong. It's like four, one, four, one, four, one, two, one, two, three, okay? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to try it again from the beginning? Yeah. Do you want to try it one more time, the excerpt? internet connection but I'm hearing the make sure it's in time it sounds a little bit too long We've lost Valentina again. I think that was about time, anyways. Okay. Uh, we can go go to uh, the next. So, Valentina, I'm sorry if we. I don't know. We we lost you again. <laughs> uh, really? But yeah. I it stopped. It stopped. So we're gonna have to move on. Um, I like. I enjoyed your playing. of a beautiful sound. Thank you. Thank you for your... Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So we're on to Antoine. Bonjour. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. So tell me, uh, where, where are you, Antoine? Uh, yet I'm in the south of France. Okay. <laughs> and what are you going to play? So um, I have uh, Beethoven 6 and Mendelssohn's Scherzo, um, the Firebird 2, and Shostakovich 9. Oh, okay. All right, um, we won't get to all of those, but let's just start. Uh, well, do you have a preference of which, uh, if we don't get to them all, which one you would like to play? Like the first two uh, that you'd like maybe, to play? Maybe uh, Beethoven first, maybe. Okay.
Okay, good. Um, nice sound. Um, I think your triplets, in the context of playing this in the orchestra, would have to be a little bit, they can be a little bit free, but I find sometimes you're holding the first note of the triplets too long, you know, you're saying, and too strong, like, I think it should just be, little bit more simple what i do like and it's, it's always a problem when i'm when i've heard like professional clarinet auditions run is in the opening people don't always play those 16th notes as true 16th they start to sound like as part of triplets so, and the hard one is to the one just before you start the triplets To make sure that that's a 16th note and you did that well um i wouldn't um here you took quite a big break is between the the octave g's was there a reason a musical reason um i don't know maybe yeah, yeah i think you have to get be a you can take a little be a little bit free though but make sure it, it shouldn't be. Just keep going. Can we try that again? That last end, end of the first movement. Yeah, to me, sorry, to me it sounds a little bit too much. So, are you thinking of keeping the same length uh, articulation throughout this? Yeah. Because it starts out um, quite long, and then you get shorter later. I think it should be the same. Okay. But shorter or? Uh, you play shorter later. Okay. I think it's okay to maybe be a little bit longer in the... Let's try the one one more time the whole thing. So it's short. Yeah, make sure that your the quality of your sound, because you do have a nice sound, but in the beginning you sound a little, it's a little spread. And those should ba 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 ba. Keep focused right here with the air, fast air. <laughs> Teacher, okay, I'm going to play what I think that I heard. No. Oftentimes in your triplets, I think the idea of phrasing from the second note of the triplet, yep, bah, 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 is is okay, but I think you're overdoing it. Okay. Like I think I know what you're trying to do. You're you're trying to avoid sounding like. But I think it's a little bit overdone now because it's starting to sound like. You know what I mean? Yes. Can you just try right, right there? Yeah, good. So. The, qu the question is always like what length to play <laughs> in terms of these notes. And I've had conductors ask, you know, for everything from very long to short. I, I kind of like right smack in the middle, you know, in terms of length. Mm -hmm. You know, the extreme would be. And the other. I think 
somewhere right in the right smack in the middle is good and simple is good mm -hmm. <laughs> you know because when this starts out you know who's accompanying you there uh, yeah it's quite a simple yeah. section yeah okay good um what else what do you want to play next uh, second move. Second Nice sound. Do you have a uh, tempo marking in your part in the opening? Yeah, it's, it's uh, 50. Yeah, so I, I just took my metronome out and was seeing where you are. You're sort of mid 60s. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, I think I think that this is a, a little bit fast. Um, you know, I've been playing over 30 years in orchestras and it's interesting with the historically informed um, movement like the first movement conductors are taking it much faster, you know, because the, um, the marking is actually, I think it's 66 to the half note. Yeah. So that the feeling is in one. So so the whole movement, is much um, faster than it used to be because they're trying to take Beethoven's markings, but this one he actually writes 50. So I think you're, you're a little fast for that marking. Okay. Okay. And in the opening, uh, what function does this note serve? The G. It's an appoggiatura, right? So I was hearing too much of the resolution. I'm exaggerating, but you know what I mean? The phrase wants to go, but there's this note in the way. So make sure that you, that note is the one that's emphasized and the resolution is less. Yeah. Try that. Yeah. Um, play the grace notes a little sooner. so. I guess I would say no. Play the grace notes no faster than you could sing them, mm -hmm. because oftentimes you hear just that one. Yeah, and a little bit more on the da 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 on the res da 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 on the appoggiatura. But don't stop the air through the grace notes. Mm -hmm. Just play once. Leave out the leave out the fast notes. Good. A little bit more. Yeah. And the notes, each note, sixteenth note should be slightly louder than the previous one so that it leads to that appoggiatura. Yeah, that's it. Now slip in the grace notes.
good. Um, I find the trill a little bit too, what's, what do you say in English, pedantic. I mean, a little bit too, like, okay. I, I'm doing this, I'm starting this note, I'm starting this trill slow, and then I'm going to get fast, and it should just be, just let it go. Um, when you have the piano, right here, have the same quality of um, um, articulation that you had when you were playing louder. Okay. And it has to do with support. Even though it's soft, shh, the air still has to be shh, shh, fast. So. Same length of staccato. Try it from there again. Oh yeah, so I was, sorry to interrupt. Um, you're still, you're used to doing this, I think, faster. So it was starting to get fast again, you know. Right. You can take your time at the bar line, because you know in Beethoven, like Beethoven loved subito pianos. <laughs> They're all through his music. And there's always, for the sound to clear, there's always just a little bit of space at the bar line. Okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so whatever you do, keep the same tempo throughout this excerpt. Okay. And then, again, the quality of the articulation uh, st stays the same whether you're playing forte or, or piano. Um, Last time you played the second one, it was good because each 16th note led to the appoggiatura. Yeah. It keeps the, the listener's interest. Otherwise, it's just... Okay, good. Maybe, maybe one more? No, I'm saying well, I'm another excerpt. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe just like which? Did you say nine? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good, good. So, um, if you're preparing for an audition, um, you know, you, you obviously you listen to uh, various versions of the different orchestras and different conductors, right? So, how do you choose a tempo? Yeah. Like, how do you choose the tempo for this? I'm just thinking about this. Um... Something, um, yeah. yeah, so I think that if you were to listen to 10 recordings of, of this with different conductors, um, this would be on a scale of 1 to 10, not 10 being the fastest, this would be about a 9, 9.5. Nine and, okay. <laughs> and for an audition, 
you know, even if you feel strongly that that's the tempo, you think, oh, I think this is what the tempo should be. Uh, I think for a, an audition, you want to be somewhere between, more between like, say, if the scale is one to 10, sort of three to seven in that range. You understand what I mean? So for me, this is a little bit fast. I like the feeling that it, it's in one, but I think it's a little too fast. Okay. You know, boom. I'm thinking a sort of comp, a sort of, for me, a tempo sort of in the middle of what's tradition. And, and it, the best way, to, I think, to get a sense of what the tempo would be to listen to a number of, there are recordings from when Shostakovich was still alive with conductors that he worked with, you know, uh, of this piece. So, you know, you can get a sense of, um, you know, obviously we can't do that. We can't do, go back and do that with the Mozart Symphony, but with Shostakovich we can. So I'm thinking more of a tempo, probably a... Okay, so we can just like take a few notches off of. Still the feeling in one is good. It's like a, almost like a very slow waltz with a few four, four bars thrown in. <laughs> something for me I'm finding the rhythm not you're not always coming off the long notes in time so sometimes when I the way I practice uh, that is I'll, I'll demonstrate you try that just play very articulate very long Yeah. So, and another thing, what, another reason why this is useful is in terms of phrasing, obviously we always want to be going to the high point evenly and then away from that high point. So when we tongue quarter notes, we can think, for instance, in this opening, we're sort of going to what? Like the one, two, three, to the fourth bar kind of, right? So we can think of each quarter note that we articulate is slightly more than the previous one. So. Now, let me start strong, a little stronger. And then evenly away. And it really... Um, it actually... You know the, Kurt, the Curtis School? in, in um, Philadelphia, uh, Marcel Tabato taught, was the oboe, principal oboe of the Philadelphia Orchestra and one of the main teachers at the Curtis Institute. He came up with a whole system. You know the system of, have you heard of the system of numbers, of phrasing? Like he would actually codify and say each part of the bar, what the intensity was, where, and he'd use a numbering system, you know. Um, and you don't have to go to that extreme, but you need to think of, where am I in each of these bars in terms of intensity? And you know, if you hear a really great performance, you think, you know, how do you, know, you sometimes you think to yourself, like, how does this player do that? How do they lead me on this journey? And oftentimes, if you really break it down and analyze it, it's the, the phrasing, it's so careful, like how they each that the performer gets to the top of the phrase and then comes away evenly. And it's the shape of the phrases. And um, my, I had a teacher used to say, um, yeah, you need to listen to really great players and try, you're never gonna sound exactly like them, but you need to listen with um, real, real focus to think what are they doing in each part of the bar? So if you were to hear a really great player that you really admire, you know, that play this solo, listen in a way that you think, What's their intensity in each part of this phrase? How, you know, just don't think, oh, that's great. I wish I could do that. Really analyze it and think, how are they doing that? What are they doing? 
in terms of intensity and, where, and what position they are in the phrase. Okay? So try that again. Again, with like tonguing each quarter note and think of it go, each one going to the to where you want to go to the top of the phrase and then evenly away. Oftentimes what happens is when we reach the top of the phrase, we don't come away evenly. We sort of let down all the tension right away. So, but think of like where you want to go, where you want to end and get there evenly. Okay. In terms of rhythm, that was much better, obviously, because you're tonguing each, each quarter note. <laughs> but think that, feel that inside, okay? Um, be just careful with that last, uh, the uh, D or Re at bar 30, that it's not too sharp. Yeah, okay. Because when you go down to the lower D, you want it to match. Mm -hmm. so, you know, on most, are you playing a buffet? Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes that's a sharp note on the buffet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what fingering were you using for the high F sharp? It sounds good. Uh, it's uh, like this. Oh, okay. Um, Another one that some works on some instruments, not all, is uh, you know with the the top the top yeah, side. Okay. Top side key. This one. Okay. Works on some instruments. Okay. And but I, what you're doing sounds good. Um, well, I yep. have to come in again to tell you that we're almost running out of time. So. All right. Thank you. Um, can we just go on? Yeah. In this little after where we finished. Actually, breathe. Do you have um, uh, rehearsal numbers? Yeah. One, two, three. Like three before thirty-one. I would just make the break. Because yeah, okay. he actually writes the phrase to end sort of there. So I, I would actually just take advantage of that. Okay. Okay. Um, I know you're trying to come in really soft on that high D, <laughs> but it's not pianissimo, it's just piano. Um, one way to practice, um, I, I do this exercise every few days to work on my entrances, like my soft entrances. Like, just take the D and play like forte and then do a diminuendo. And then restart the note. And keep so keep the remember where that the position here is, and where what the air is doing when you come down to the end of the diminuendo. And this, I just do the, do a scale and do that. You know, right, right from. You know, and all the way up into the altissimo. Okay. All right. Nice to hear you play. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have Bella. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
five. I can't see you yet. Oh. Okay, Bella, what uh, excerpts do you have? Okay, uh, I have Beethoven four, second and fourth movement, um, Mozart Così Fan Tutti, uh, Sibelius Symphony one, first movement, Semiramide, and Peter and the Wolf. All right. Um, let's, what would you like to start with? We won't get to all of them, obviously, but. Yeah. Let's start with uh, Mozart. Okay. How are you, by the way? I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> I'm good, yeah. How are you? Bella used to study with me <laughs> a while ago. Good. Um, so f for some of you, you may not know this excerpt. Um, it's actually uh, part of Cosi Van Tutte in the second act. I think it's supposed to be an outdoor scene near the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it's a wind band. It's a uh, sextet, two clarinets, two bassoons, um, two, two horns. And in, Mo in uh, Mozart's time, uh, sort of late, also in, in Haydn, the mo a lot of the nobility would actually have wind sextets or wind octets hired full time to play uh, for various events for the nobility. So this would have been a case in the opera where it would have been a, case, yeah, a, a situation where um, it's outdoor party. So of course a wind sextet would be playing in the background. Um, so I think because it's wind sextet, Bella, I found you were playing a little bit, could be just the connection, a little bit like under. I think you could play a little bit more um, like you're leading, a little bit more uh, soloistically, because mm -hmm. you're the top voice in, in the sextet. Okay. So I would play a little bit more, a little bit, with a little bit more sound and intensity, even though, you know, it says piano, but think it's just winds mm -hmm. <laughs> playing together. Okay, good. Um, this is sort of a, an observation generally, or a, a, an observation and maybe a question. In the orchestral context, uh, is the clarinet section usually accused of being late or early? Ooh, um, I want to say early, but that might be wrong. Tends to be late. It's a little bit the nature of the way the instrument speaks. It always wants to go, ah, ah. Okay. You need to play a little bit more on the front of the beat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's sounding a little bit like. It needs to sound a little bit more. I mean, I, I don't want you to sound like a piano, but it should sound, you know how a piano has front on the note? Mm -hmm. You need just a little bit more front on the note. Okay. Yeah, and then real sustain through the... Constant 
an air. So careful not, that's one place where you're actually rushing. Okay. Really even fingers. Just do um, the second one, second time it comes. Okay. Yeah, and really good connection. Okay, so what's happening below you here? Uh, that's the Alberti bass in the second clarinet. Exactly. So you have to be right in time. Okay. You know. Right there. So I think we'll talk, just speak a little bit about um, how we f resonate the sound and for formulate the sound. Um, you always want the air to be, to focus the air right at the point of the reed. And some people think that, oh yeah, you got to just blow a lot of air through the instrument. I like to think of setting the air, setting the air in motion in the tube of the clarinet. Okay. So, shh, 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 um, it's interesting. I read an article recently that Anth uh, Anthony Gigliotti, who was the former principal clarinet of the Philadelphia Orchestra, was talking about this concept and about um, breathing and how we support the air. So. You know, he talks about like re filling up all through the back also. And then as we play, we when we take a big breath in, we don't, what happens oftentimes is players take a breath in and when, as soon as they start to play, they contract like this. But what we want is to breathe in. And as we start to play, the support, certainly the front, like all around here, the low, lower back, stomach stays out. And, and he said, the singers do this too. They'll, um, this concept of keeping this out and when they sing, it stays out and very slowly comes in as they exhaust their air. And you can sort of demonstrate, you, you can actually work on this by, the singers do this. <clears throat> Take a breath in. I'll just normally speak. I'll, I'll say some ridiculous sentence. Uh, and I'll just talk normally. I have purposely left the dynamics of all the arias as the composers wrote them. Now I'm going to take a breath in, keep my diaphragms, keep all of this out, and then say the same phrase. I have purposely left the dynamics of all the arias just as the composers wrote them. You're trying to get more resonance in the way you speak by keeping the support here. I didn't do a very good job just then. But you can practice, you can actually work on that. And it's the same um, concept of when you play the instrument. It's the difference between and and right here, that 
that's where the air is focused. Right here. Like if you say, Okay, you want to give that a try again? Yeah, and really keep the air. So if I'm just blowing air, I'll blow into the microphone. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. Keep that air going. Okay. Right at the reed. Don't don't let it go in and out. Okay. That's better. That's much better, Bella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, always think resonance. Okay. Not necessarily uh, volume, like you, because if you have resonance, that will make the sound carry no matter what dynamic you play. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do the Peter and the Wolf? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, your, your triplets were good. Um, the thing about this excerpt is <laughs> You really have to be prepared to play it all different ways because you never know what the conductor is going to do. You sort of did it like as as Prokofiev wrote the night starting at ninety six. Oftentimes it's done slower. But I I recently did this where a conductor did exactly what's written, and I actually no no slowing down at the beginning of the triplets either. So be prepared to do it, you know. You know, <laughs> be prepared to go right away. Um, I, I, you see, you did okay in the triplets. I, I, I tend to um, think of them just as eighth notes instead of triplets. I find it slows my fingers down. You did okay on that. Also, I um, I play after many years of playing this on the A clarinet. I s decided to do it on the B flat clarinet, not because of the triplet passage, because that's the same on either instrument, but for the uh, grace notes. Mm -hmm. So, what what chord is the first grace note? But mostly, what is what is the first chord of the of the uh, precipitato? Is it? Oh, is it? Hold on. It's. D, what, what is it? D sharp, F sharp, A, B natural. It's a, it's a, it's a B seventh, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, mine's just written different. Um, yeah, it's E, e, e flat. I, I, just, I said it that way because it's easier to figure out the chord. Okay. <laughs> and the next one is what? It's, uh, it's an F sharp 7, right? Yeah. So what I would do is I would practice make sure that my B flat 7th chord is really under my fingers. Sorry, I, I meant B. I'm playing, I'm thinking B flat clarinet. The B7 chord. Yeah. And then the F sharp seven. Yeah. 
you know. So think of the practice, and also practice them on the beat, slow. Uh, uh. Okay. Because that's always for me that that's always the tough one. And I, I, I what fingering are you using for the high of sharp? Uh, right now I'm using just the regular fingering. Yeah, it's a little dangerous. <laughs> Um, in the con in context of doing it, uh, I know some people use the um, the overblown B flat. Mm, yeah. So I, I mean, obviously you don't don't do it now, but uh, <laughs> just try it once doing uh, playing what I just did slowly on the beat. Da 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 da. But really in time, like da 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 da. That, that really clear. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's a little messy, a little slower. Da, 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 da. That's it. Next one. Yeah. So you should be able to play that any tempo. Okay. Really ha to have it under your fingers. And I think just generally, I, I guess during this, if I've learned anything, one of the things I've sort of worked on during this extended break during COVID is um, in terms of, like my, my technique, just practicing scales, thirds, chords, and then really relating it to what the repertoire, you know, like right, for instance, right here, really thinking that, okay, what are these chords? And I practice these chords all the time. So what is my hand position when I play, you know, like a B, B major seven. And when you get to that spot, make sure your fingers are in that position. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Relate the your the, your repertoire to your the work the technical work that you do. Okay. I mean I, I know at your your stage uh, that you probably do, but that's always an issue with my students. Like I've, I'm finding in first and second year, it's like they have their silos. It's like they do their technique over here, then they do their repertoire over here, and never the twain shall meet, sometimes. <laughs> so I'm always having to say, what chord is that? You know that chord. Put your fingers in that position for that chord. And they go, oh, yeah, that works. And it takes a while to sort of, you know, relate the technical work to the repertoire. Mm -hmm. and not every, you know, not every chord starts on the root. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Kimball. Yeah. Uh, we can go for another five minutes, then we'll be uh, going to the next uh, musician. All right. Uh, do you want to try this one one more time? Sure. Maybe just a little slower. <laughs> Yeah, that, that that actually even at even at the faster tempo, you you rush the second da 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 da. Okay. Really in time da da da, and the quarter note with the dot. Think of it as a eighth note full value da 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 not da 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 da. It shouldn't be the same uh, staccato length as the as the eighth notes. Okay. Da 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 da. Good. So, have you ever tried it on the B flat clarinet? No, not really. I would be because actually, you do, even though the whole part is an A clarinet. Towards the end, you have to switch to. Um, I played parts of it on the um, B flat clarinet because there's those, and it's a lot harder. E flat major and then F sharp major. Most people I know play that part on the B flat, so you have to have your B flat out anyways. Okay. So I find this um, easier to do. On, on the B flat clarinet after many years, and uh, it's interesting because I was uh, I remember talking to I won't say which player, but uh, one of the players in, 
you know, 20 years ago in the big five work, or one of the big five orchestras saying, yeah, I says, when this piece comes up, I never quite know how it's going to go. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you, you want to play it on the instrument, I think, that's easiest. So I, I would try it on the B flat. Okay. Mostly for the grace notes at the end. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, we probably have to move on, but what else? Did you have anything short? I can't remember your other excerpts. Uh, I've got the fourth movement of Beethoven 4. That is short. Okay, I would suggest to playing the first four notes tongue, even if you're going to slur the others. Oh, okay. It to the listener's ear, they hear the first four notes. Then after that, because you're with the, it's not like the the bassoon, where it's solo. Mm-hmm. You're playing this with the, the violin, so you just heard in the background. Mm-hmm. So we can kind of get away with doing the two and two, unless you can double. Um, but. <laughs> But if you get the impression of the, if the the ear hears the first four and then it's almost like they think, oh yeah, they're playing tongue for the the whole thing. Okay. Okay. So I'll leave that with you. All right. All right. Where are you, Bella, right now? Uh, In theory, I'm in Toronto, but today I'm in Ottawa. Okay. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. So now we have Kaylin. Hi, Kaylin. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, so what do you have today? Um, I'm going to do Brahms 3, first and second movement, and then uh, Beethoven 8, and I also have the Verdi, Quazza del Bastino, and uh, Capriccio, first movement. All right, let's start with the Brahms. Where are you? Um, I'm in Montreal now. Yeah, I finished at GGS, and now I'm at McGill. Okay. Oh, by the way, how did the... Um, <laughs> I, I worked with Kayla in the National Youth Orchestra of Canada. How did that the tour go with the, um, the Vaughn Williams? <laughs> it was good. It was really yeah. good. I mean, I, th- I heard it in Ottawa, but... Uh, Oh, you heard it in Ottawa. Oh, I was yeah. really sick in Ottawa. But uh, anyway, it was fun. <clears throat> comment mostly was just the very opening i didn't get a sense of the tempo until about the third the the, like well once you're already into the bar yeah okay okay um interesting point about this solo it's it's a very it's a very fast the opening starts on b flat clarinet and there's a very fast clarinet change yes (laughs) so some some people play the opening on a clarinet you know that that solo, ba da ba da ba da ba di ba 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 ba. So they don't have to change. I mean, I've always liked it on the B flat. Then I yeah. do the switch, but um, it's it's interesting in the orchestra. You have to play this much. 
louder than you think because of the you know what's happening in the orchestra um also because of the, the register of the clarinet and that brings up the interesting point about like well what do you do for an audition then <laughs> do you play exactly what's written do you play it differently than you would in the orchestra to bring out the dynamics i would say for auditions generally you want to do as much as you can to show your dynamic range okay. because after sitting for years and years listening to auditions people most people's dynamic range comes across as about like this and the players oftentimes that really catch your ear it's like this okay? okay so you know play out in the opening a little bit it doesn't say sotto voce it says mezzo voce yeah and then you know real pianissimo after that uh the other thing to think about is when you have All of a sudden there you're not you're no longer the melody even it is written piano but all that transfers to somewhere else in the orchestra and now we're sort of an accompanying line okay so i, I found it was just a little bit loud okay sure. try this again so really have the tempo in mm -hmm. mind when you start before you start So I still find it a little bit too. It, maybe it's the connection. Maybe I'm it's, it's clipping out the first note. I don't know, but I'm I'm hearing. Or, da, 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 da. That was better. Okay. That was better. Now, one of the things, um, one of the reasons this isn't on every single clarinet audition is listening to how well the clarinet clarinetist on the A clarinet goes over the break. <laughs> you know, yeah. keeping the, the sound quality uh, consistent over the break, which you're doing pretty well. But make sure you don't rush some of the eighth notes, you know. Is the tendency? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what I was doing with Antoine, also, you know, you could actually do. Or just really think of like through through that held out la da 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 I um, full value. Once more. Do you want me to do the articulations or just? No, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, can you just play once? Can you just play once? Leave out the D. What? Really even. That's better. Now play. It's getting better. Yeah. So you really need to have that evenness in the fingers, like going over the break. Okay. And same. play that one yeah it rushes a little bit that's it that's the challenge in this excerpt yeah <laughs> and evenness of tone color over the break right yeah uh I won't stop you now. Go from the beginning.
remember how I was just mentioning about the dynamic contrasts? When you got in bar, you had bar numbers? Yep. So in bar 42, it's pianissimo, yeah. right? Yeah. It's so one enough. way to bring that out, one way is to play that softer, but also to keep the sound up in the bar before, yeah. right to the end of the bar. So, go from The other thing about this solo is to, uh, or this passage, it's not all solo, is to think of horizontally. You know, because it's very, if we were to do it literally, there's a lot of articulation, right? Yeah. So we need to think also, make those points articulated with the tongue, but also think longer lines. of feeling all the way through so it never it just never becomes static so all right yeah. so for you i think for this you know little think longer lines more dynamic contrast and evenness in the fingers. Right. Okay. You know, a lot of that is, and thinking of the, the time before you start. One, two, three, one, da, da, da. So if, no, ba, the strings before that go, um, ba, da, 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 da. Ba, da, da, uh, 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 um, ba, da, da. Before you start, uh, 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 um, ba, da, da. Okay? Good. Um, a little bit of the second movement then? So nice playing. Um, now, in this excerpt, 
we need to figure out in bar three, like what we're going to do in terms of articulation. Yeah. And how is that going to be different from one, two, three, four before A? And then, uh, you know, the section before B. Yeah. Like you're you're slurring right from the sixteenth note to the next. Ah, oh, ta, -da, ta -da. Yeah. Okay. It's it's interesting because I had I've had conductors who are like when I talked about the historically informed movement, they would say like, because I was doing that before A also, and they said, "Why are you slurring? That's not what's written." <laughs> yeah. So I think there should be a difference between bar three. And then before, you know, and I think those ones should be articulated. Okay. Not, not, I'm not saying like, but, but I think they should be articulated. Yeah. Um, and what about in bar three, if you were just to do a very long articulation? Yeah. Like, something like that um, and then after a it was it was all good intonation was quite good after a the pianissimo a throat a's maybe one more finger down okay. <laughs> it was just a little bit sharp okay, okay. Uh, do you want to try this again So uh, is, is the beginning was, was good. I like the third bar. How did you feel about that? Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Um, I think it's just been a tradition because it was written in, you know, the Bonad excerpt book? Yeah. For, it was written that way in the, there, and I think just a lot of clarinet players have just always done it that way. Yeah. But it's not actually what's written. Um, in bar six, getting to your be, be natural on the fourth beat, be prepared for it. It doesn't quite speak. Okay. You got to be prepared to fill the whole tube after the the A. It should be come out as sounding the same quality as the A. Just take it from bar five. One, two, three, four, five. That's a little bit that I, I that's a little bit much. Okay. Dom pa pa pom pa pa. Take it from. And when you get to that throat A, before you go to the do the op octave leap, make sure air. doesn't sound strong enough it sounds too soft
can you make that whole four bars in one breath? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't have. You know, we, we don't need to do it again. But I think we. I don't think yeah. you need that breath. No, I don't. Let's do A. After A, one, two, three, four. When well, you're playing, when you have the piano, that could, right away that can be a little more. And then it's it's like you pose you pose a thought. You're leaving it out there. Then resolution. You know what I mean? Yeah. Make, make two two different sort of statements. Good. Um, one more, maybe. Sure. What do you have? Uh, Beethoven. Okay, good. Um, so what's the accompaniment doing here? Um, the cellos have the triplets. Yeah. And, and the horns are small. Yeah, so the horns are. I think you need to have that orchestra playing in your head before you start. Again, I don't get a real sense of the tempo when you start. Okay. Okay. It just doesn't seem like you're really set. Um, this is a point about auditions when you, you do it from a, um, I guess, audition committee perspective. When we hear a candidate that really picks, because sometimes you're hearing like a hundred candidates or more, and the candidates that really pick up your pick up one's ear are when they play, and it's almost like you can hear all the other orchestra parts as they play, and it's because they're playing musically in context of how their part fits into the orchestra and it's just other people have said this too and i've experienced this it's like oh i can hear all the other parts and when someone doesn't play that way it just sounds like oh they're just playing the clarinet yeah okay. so you need to be really engaged with what's going on in the orchestra in your mind and in your body in terms of the rhythm before you start so in one, two, three. Take a, just take a few seconds before you start this again and see if you can really have a strong uh, mental image, sound image in your head of the orchestra.
I just find that the first three notes rush. Oh, okay. You just play one, leave one out. Just play it. One, two, three. Okay. Actually, I want you to do this. I'll demonstrate. One, two, three, one. I want you to do that. Just say one, two, three, one, set, and then play. One, two, three, one. Closer. You have a tendency, you might want to record yourself. You have a tendency to be too fast between the first two notes. Okay. Uh, and when you play, the, one of the things you we want in this excerpt is um, to make sure that that uh, 16th note triplet is lyrical because it all it tends to always sound I think I said about Beethoven's sixth slow, uh, slow movement no faster than you could sing it okay. all right give it a try yeah and don't Make sure the air continues through those six, that triplet. Because mm. to my ear, it gets dropped. One way you can practice it is. Just try that once. And then the third time, play it as written. So I think if you recorded yourself, you would hear that you drop. You're still doing it. Oh. Think about playing more through the triplet okay. so we hear it. Yeah. Okay. So that sort of contributes to the, the that sort of con that I do, he, what we hear is the too fast and a little too frantic. But if you yeah. have the air go through the triplet and play it absolutely sort of in time, you know, it'll be much more effective. Can we go on to... Um... Good, so it's the same thing there, right? That time you blew you blew through it more, but it's just a little too fast. Um, and as much as possible, you know, the high G. Not. And for that, I'm keeping my embouchure quite stable. I'm not really biting more or less. I'm, the change happens inside the mouth. Ooh, ooh, wee, ooh, wee. You know, higher in the back, airstream goes from be, being out this way to being the, the sense of being sh shooting almost like straight down the chin. If you were to hold your hand out and blow, just sort of the beginning of that excerpt, the air would be going down here. But then for the high G, the air is, is going, focusing down here. Because as, as the um, back of the throat comes up, the airstream goes more straight down. Right. Okay. Can I just try that again? And start quite forte here, so you can, again, so you can make the contrast. Much better. Let's go on. Yeah, a little bit more focus. Well, it, there's two ways that musically to do this is to lift a little bit. Or a little bit of a lift.
Good. Um, it, it usually slows down a little bit at the end and gets a little longer. You know. Um, yeah, I should say one thing. It always happens in this sol solo for me. That always is always a problem. Is the cello usually play too loud? <laughs> so in context, I always find I have to play this solo quite very full. Uh, more, more than you'd think. So I would play my, my loud, my fortes a little more to make the contrast. Also, uh, the should all sound yeah. the same. Try that. You know what? I wouldn't half hold because it's for, it's, it's quite loud. Try without half holding. That's better. It pops out better. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention this earlier, but um, another thing that I've been doing a lot more during COVID is <laughs> in my own practice sessions, so they have more time, is uh, practicing double lip. Okay. Do you ever practice play, playing double lip? Not super often. I would try and do that regularly, like for 10 minutes or so during your practice sessions, even if you just do scales, like just because they're so short, you know, it's, it's can be tiring until you get used to it. Um, but that, that sensation of, you know, coming, having all of your lips engaged on the mouthpiece. And for something like this, just try and play that double lip. No half hole. And louder. See what it does is by, by having the jaws a little bit more open, it lets the reed vibrate. And it also, what happens when you push your top lip down? What happens in the throat? What do you feel? Does the back go up or go down? Yeah. Tongue, tongue goes back into the position it needs to be for voicing the sound. Right. So it, I mean, there are great players who actually their whole career played double lip, like, you know, Harold right. Wright. Yeah. Richard Stoltzman plays double lip um, okay. all the time, standing. <laughs> Some players, you know, when they play double lip, would rest the, the bell on their knees and, and sit. But it really opens this up. And also does the, the other thing it does is you don't, you know, a lot of people, obviously, they bite on the clarinet. So they come down this way rather than being round. And playing double lip you know, causes you to pull in the sides of the mouth. You get a lot more resonance on the instrument. So I would suggest uh, practicing a bit each day double lip. You don't have to become a double lip player, but it, it really um, opens up your sound. Um, and you'll, oftentimes you'll find like connection between intervals is much better double lip. Right. Okay. Right. Cool. Yeah. The other thing that it does <laughs> is if you play some practice some technique playing double lip, if you're heavy with your fingers because you know like it's much it's a much more tenuous grip when you're not sort of clamping down on the mouthpiece, but you'll find that sometimes people find that oh, I'm really being quite too forceful with my fingers and it causes you to actually and this is good for your technique too. It um, causes you to use less ten pressure with your fingers on the instrument, so your your technique become your fingers and hands become more supple. Okay. Okay. It's yeah. good to hear you again. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Campbell. Uh, that was our last participant, I guess. Yes, it was. Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Campbell. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. I'm sorry you can't see me right now, but I'm here. I was uh, your timekeeper and I le carefully listened yeah, and uh, enjoy. Yeah, thank you. thank you very much. Do you have any uh, any thoughts uh, you want to share with all for a wrap up? Um, I would say the last month and a half probably has been some of the most difficult period, difficult period in a lot of people's lives and certainly for musicians, it's been very difficult. 
Um, I'm quite impressed to hear everybody playing at the level that you were playing at today. Um, sort of a testament to your commitment to, I guess, the craft. And it, it was a real pleasure to hear everyone playing today. And I guess that I would just finish off. If anybody has, I know we're basically out of time, but if anybody has a question, um, you know, please let me know. Yes, we'll take we'll take comments and we'll we'll send you uh, any questions people have uh, okay. our participants. Yeah, we'll we'll gladly do that. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, and uh, this is what ends today's masterclass. Thank you to all participants, member of the public, and to our guest Kimball Sykes. And once again, thank you to all of our sponsors. Et ceci qui termine la classe de maître d'aujourd'hui. Merci de votre présence, public, participants, et tout particulièrement à notre invité. Kimball Sykes. Encore une fois, des remerciements sincères à tous nos commanditaires. Thanks for watching. Merci de votre présence.